But to uh, understand Cahokia, we have to really uh, realize that things came before Cahokia. There are other Indian cultures uh, throughout the Americas, going back maybe 12, 13,000, 14,000 BC. So there were other people in the area before Cahokia became the mountain that it did. But uh, so it built on cultures that had preceded it. And it became the largest prehistoric Indian site in America, the largest community north of Mexico. And it, was the, it wasn't until the 1800s that Philadelphia passed it in size. So it covered about six square miles, had around 120 mounds, and maybe 10 to 20,000 people living there. So that's why we use the term city when we talk about it, because it was so much bigger than everything else. And it was part of a, a complex, we sometimes call Greater Cahokia, which included the mound groups in East St. Louis and St. Louis as well, all connected. But uh, one of the reasons Cahokia probably became as big and as important as it did is partly because of its location. And we're near the confluence of the Illinois, Mississippi, and Missouri rivers. And this confluence has created this large floodplain. It's called the American Bottom on the eastern side of the, of the Mississippi River. Cahokia is situated near the center of that. It's about 11 miles across here. But over you know, the thousands and thousands of years, uh, with the, these rivers did change their, their course. The Mississippi zigzagged back and forth, carving out this floodplain, and left behind lots of old lakes and marshes and sloughs that were important aquatic uh, resources for fish and waterfowl and other uh, water-based plants and things that they utilized. So there's lots of resources here. The rivers were basically highways back in the, they were the interstates for travel and trade, and they were dug out canoes. So this confluence is very important. Plus, these rivers laid down very fertile soils that was good for agriculture. And this was an ag agriculturally based society. So location, 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 as they say, is always important. And as I mentioned, Cahokia was the biggest community. There are other groups of about 50 mounds in East St. Louis, and then about 26 or 7 mounds just north of the Arch, down at Pulcher and up at Mitchell, or another groups of about 12 mounds or so. So those are some of the major settlements. Then there are a lot of single mound communities, then a lot of moundless hamlets and farmsteads scattered throughout this whole area. But probably all of your Cahokia is rural, and uh, all say, interacting and connected with each other. Acting up today. So, do it this way. So at the Hokie itself, the mounds are laid out in kind of a rough diamond-shaped pattern. Uh, of the original 120 mounds, there's maybe about 80 that survived today in some form or another. They've been plowed down by farming or highways and subdivisions, discount stores and other things that impacted much of the site. But the state of Illinois now owns 2,200 acres here in most of the central core of the site, and including uh, 70 of the remaining 80 mounds that we detect as Cahokia Mounds, state historic sites. Now this painting kind of gives an idea of what Cahokia might have looked like at its peak, sort of downtown Cahokia. And there were two creeks that came together. Canteen Creek joins Cahokia Creek, which eventually flows into the Mississippi. There's Horseshoe Lake up here. But this was, a, like I say, a very large and very complex uh, community. And the biggest mound at the site is called Muck's Mound. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It overlooks the, the Grand Plaza, this big public space, twin mounds down here. Some of the ponds you see are these are formed in borrow pits, places where they you know, dug up the dirt you know, to build mounds. And left depressions in the ground which you know, fill with water. But there are also, again, some of these old lakes and sloughs that are a result of uh, former channels of the, of the Mississippi, long before Cahokia was here. The river is about where it is today. Uh, when Cahokia was occupied. Their are fields would be all around the city to grow the food, the amount of food they needed to feed the thousands of people that were here. Um, wood hens, their sun calendar, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. And mound 72, a small ridgetop mound that 
was very significant. But these are some of the major features. But also, at one point in time, they built a big wall around the center of their city, we call the stockade or palisade. Basically, it was a fort to uh, protect this central ceremonial precinct. So indication of warfare and conflict were uh, fairly common. And we see a lot of sites uh, being fortified during the period of Cahokia. We call this the Mississippian period. We don't know what the people call themselves or their community. They were gone from here um, by the 1300s. So uh, uh, the name Cahokia comes from a later group of Indians that moved into the area in the 1600s and established a, a village where the French met them in 1699, where the town of Cahokia is today. And a local historian thought it would be uh, good to name the mounds after after that tribe was back in the 1800s. So it kind of caught on after that. That's where the name Cahokia comes from. But there was, it wasn't the Cahokia Indians that built the mounds, it was the earlier Mississippi culture that built the mounds. <coughs> yeah. Gotta change batteries, I guess. So at Cahokia, we have uh, in the center of the Grand Plaza, this big open space where they have their public gatherings, festivals, games, markets, other kinds of special activities. But from excavations and other testing that we've done, we can see they actually artificially built up this area to make it all flat and level. Uh, because normally the terrain is kind of undulating, what we call ridge and swale topography. They filled in the low spots, maybe knocked off high spots, brought in more dirt to level it all. So they were moving a tremendous amount of dirt. That covers over 40 acres at Grand Plaza. And there are other plazas throughout the site as well. The north end is Monk's Mound, the Big Mound, the Twin Mounds here at the south end. And other smaller mounds uh, were around the perimeter as well. So the mound types, we have three basic types. The, the most common variety is the one you see on top there what we call temple mounds or platform mounds, they rectangular, they're not for burials, they're used for buildings, they elevate important places where leaders live, where ceremonies took place, other kinds of special public buildings were placed on top of these mounds. Down below, the second more common type is the conical or round top mound. And that's sort of a carryover tradition from earlier peoples in the area where that form is often used for burials of some of the you know, people of high status. But most people weren't buried in mounds at all. There were cemeteries throughout the community, or up on the bluffs. Uh, and the third type of mound is kind of unique to the Cahokia area, what we call a ridge top mound. They're longer than they are wide, and they come to a crest on the top, kind of like a roof does. And they're kind of, like I say, unique to Cahokia and some of the surrounding sites. This is an aerial photograph of the Powell Mound at the western edge of the site as it appeared back in 1922, one of the first aerial photographs made of an archaeological site. And it was all you know, farmland back then, as you can see. There's Collinsville Road, or old US 40 here. And Interstate 5570 now runs right over here. 111, right back here. But uh, the farmer who owned this mound wanted to use the dirt from it to fill in this low area uh, so he could plant more horseradish <laughs> and other crops. But uh, and that's probably the Indian borrow pit where they dug up the dirt to build that mound. And he was afraid the state was going to use eminent domain. He offered to sell it or, or to have uh, archaeologists dig it if they would even offer money for it if they would put the dirt over here. But even back then, archaeologists didn't work that way. The state offered to buy it and an access road that he didn't want to sell a hunk out of the middle <coughs> field. So in anticipation there might be eminent domain. And in the winter of 1930-31, he hired a steam shovel had that mound taken down. So it's basically destroyed. But the, notice the dark line inside shows where the top of that mound had been at an earlier time. It was originally a flat top mound, then was made into a ridge top mound. It's sort of a final ceiling <coughs> of that mound. Uh, it was about this far gone when archaeologists did hear about it. You see some of them standing down here. To give you an idea, it's about 40 feet tall. And they did a little excavation on that old surface and found that there were layers of shell beads and burials and cedar poles and things that mostly got steam shoveled away, unfortunately. But it's not just the, the mounds we're concerned about. The land around the mounds is where the people live. That's where their houses were, where their daily activities took place. You often learn more about them digging out here than they do on a mound. 
But uh, so we hate to see any of the uh, lost or disturbed this way. The mounds were all built by hand, a basket load at a time. They didn't have horses, didn't have wagons or carts, they all done with human labor. And like I said, we can still see the borrow pits where they dug up a lot of the dirt. Some of those borrow pits got filled back in like city dumps. They reused the land, uh, urban renewal going on. Uh, also, we see that most mounds were enlarged over time, so maybe when a leader had died, they might burn down or tear down the old building on top, add more dirt, put up a new building for the new leader, so over time, the mounds tend to get bigger, even some of the smaller ones. When we dig into a mound, these are two different places on Monk's Mound where we had excavations over the years. We can actually see the individual <coughs> basket loads of dirt. They're piling up. They're getting dirt from different places where it's different colors or different levels, where it's different texture and color. And so here you can see you know, the basket load of sort of tan colored dirt, dark gray, light gray. They're getting dirt from different places. <coughs> so you can see how big the basket load is. It's about 50, 60 pounds, depending on the type of soil. Uh, other times, instead of just piling it and packing it down, they were spreading the dirt out in layers over large areas like you see here, but alternating light and dark colored soil. So it looks like they're doing some soil engineering. They're selecting certain soils for their you know, texture and for their, sometimes for their color. Um, we don't know if the mounds were actually covered with grass or vegetation or they were kept up air uh, or the color of the soil might be symbolic to them. Uh, but we do know that they did a lot of repairs from time to time. As uh, some of our excavations, we can see where gullies had washed out, and they'd fill them back in with more dirt. So they were doing repair jobs when they needed to. So Monk's Mound, Hakahoki, is not only the largest mound there, it's the largest prehistoric earthwork in the Americas. Of all of North or South America, it's the largest totally earthen mound built by ancient people. It covers over 14 acres at the base, it's 100 feet high, has several different terraces, or first terrace, second terrace on the west side, and two levels up on top, the third and fourth terraces. And <coughs> we've had excavations on the very top, <coughs> over on this corner where the stairs are, and over on this side, and a couple other areas where we've done actual coring through the mound to get a, extracting the core of the soil for us so we can identify some of these different building stages. But uh, it wasn't all built at once, but probably the main core of the site was built in a generation. Over in the next oh, 100 years or so, it was probably added to or modified to some degree. But uh, we know from the dig on top, there used to be a huge building over 100 feet long, about 50 feet wide, about the size of a basketball court. And that's where most likely the Paramount Chief may have lived there, governed from there, and they may have stored the bones of ancestor leaders there, or the council meetings, uh, the council of elders might have met there, but it was a huge structure, so it would be another you know, 30 or 40 feet higher, uh, and very visible from the distance. You can see Horseshoe Lake there in the background. And there's, right here behind it is Interstate 5570, Palm So, uh, in this artist's reconstruction, you can see what it may have looked like from the distance uh, through uh, off the edge of the, this, the Grand Plaza. This would be a view from, not from where the museum is today. And people lived around the mounds, as you can see, in their houses, single family dwellings for the most part. And uh, probably family groups or clans had their own neighborhoods, uh, and shared cooking and storage activities, etc. We don't know how they picked their leader. Was he the son of the previous chief? Was he selected by the Council of Elders? Was he an accomplished warrior or some kind of combination? But at <coughs> both religious and you know, political authority, not just for Kamoki, but much of the surrounding area as well. One of the few mounds that had extensive excavations into it was Mound 72. And from 1967 to 1971, archaeologists dug there. And one of the reasons they selected it because it occurs along what one archaeologist thought was the center line of Cahokia. And he thought where that center line hits the end of Mount 72, which would be right here, there might be a, a post, like a marker post, that they were measuring the way he thought they were and laying out their community. And so he began excavations there and you know, found things that did not anticipate. Well, he did find where that big post had been, right here. 
And near that was the burial of a man who was probably one of the early leaders of Cahokia, laid on a blanket of about 20,000 shell beads, people buried around him, piles of grave offerings. Then there was a small mound built over them. So there's actually three smaller mounds under this small mound, which is only about seven feet high. Uh, under the center, there was a big burial pit that had 53, uh, mostly young women, laid out in two rows and piled in there too deep, all about 15 to 25 years old, apparently sacrificed. Next to them were four men with their heads and hands cut off. Uh, three more burial pits, uh, 19, 24, 22 young women. Other burials over here, uh, two layers of burials in this pit. Uh, the bottom one had, I think, 39 uh, people and uh, maybe a couple more. Uh, they'd just been tossed in, they weren't carefully laid out, looked like they'd been uh, pushed, at, maybe clubbed and pushed in there. Uh, then on top of them were 15 people who were carried there on litters or stretchers. They were very carefully placed in, in the burial complex there. So we see different kinds of burial treatment. So when you treat people differently when they're dead, it means you, something wasn't different about them when they were alive. So that you see differences in class or rank in society by the different kinds of burial treatments. So eventually all this was finally covered with a, a final capping of soil to make that small, rich top mound. Some of the uh, grave offerings included uh, 15 of these things we call chunky stones or discoidals. They're apparently used in the game, a game that was very common among uh, Mississippian people, but also still played by later Indian groups, so we have some ideas about how it was done. A pile of mica, a mineral from the southern Appalachians, uh, Kentucky, and, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina area. We feel lucky to find one little piece. Here we had almost two bushels of it. Uh, the raw, unprocessed material. It's often used to make ornaments and jewelry. It's kind of, it comes in thin layers, it's translucent. A roll of copper, the only kind of metal they had, <coughs> no gold or silver or iron. Uh, and the copper comes from around Lake Superior, and where they find it in pure nuggets, and it's traded around, and they heat it and hammer and heat it, hammer until they flatten out the thin sheets, and cut ornamental pieces for you know, ceremony uh, ornaments and things like that. Uh, in this case, it looks like several sheets have been wrapped around a, a wooden staff and maybe the leader held as a symbol of authority. Uh, or it may have been the symbolic spear that was used in the chunky game, too. Some more shell beads down here. And there are two piles of arrowheads, about 400 in each pile, all perfectly made, never used, or made as, as tribute to this dead leader. And uh, uh, they're made out of flint that came from uh, Wisconsin, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Illinois, and also notice the different shapes and styles and colors. Uh, and they're in groups like they maybe a quiver or a bundle was, you know, placed in there. So we don't know who this guy was. Was he one of the early leaders of Cahokia, one of the founders? He was buried around 1050 A.D., and that's when the city really sort of exploded and people moved in from outlying communities to be part of Cahokia. And that's when the, a lot of the mounds started being built, and a lot of the, the complex activities there. Maybe he was one of the early leaders. We just don't know. But someone who was very important. So we dug further into the mound. Uh, see this dark layer here? That shows where the ground surface used to be. Then there were some people buried right here. Those were those four men with their heads and hands cut off, starting to be exposed here. But you can see where one of those primary mounds was built over them, and it kind of covered this area here where you see this large rectangular disturbed area and that turned out to be the big pit with the 53 women in it. So any place the Indians dug a hole in the ground, we can tell because they disturbed the natural order of the dirt. It never goes back in the hole the same way it came out. Different colors and types get tumbled together. So we see this kind of mottled look. Whereas out here, it's pretty uniform in color, what we call sterile soil. So we can tell where these you know, various <coughs> features and activities uh, were located. At the western end of the mound, there was another pile of over 400 arrowheads. These look like they may have been in a basket or some other kind of container. And over 36,000 shell beads made out of seashell. And they were using the, the whelk shell, it comes from the Gulf Coast or the Florida coast, uh, to make these various types of beads. So a lot of unusual activities. We don't know if this kind of activity took place during the whole history of Cahokian or just during that beginning period, uh, but it's... Uh, very intriguing. 
These are close-ups of some of the arrowheads. You can see each one's a little bit different than the one next to it, either in length or width or notching or material, and just how precisely they're all made. And that's apparently very old tribute. They also built that big wall around the center of their city, and we call them again the stockade or palisade. And we know from excavations that we've done so far that it was built at least four times. It was almost two miles long. So just looking how many trees are just in that little section you're looking at here. It'll take 15 to 20,000 logs each time to build a wall like this. It's that long. About every 90 feet along the wall, they had these bastions that stick out. These would be like guard towers. They would have raised platforms inside them where warriors could stand to shoot arrows over the top or catch enemy in a crossfire between the towers. A very basic form of defense that we see all around the world, uh, bastions. And each time they built it was a little bit different. The first wall had small round bastions like you see here, and the second <coughs> big square ones like you just saw in the last picture. Then the third and fourth time they get progressively smaller and they're open on the back, probably running out of trees by then, or you know, probably cut down most of the local wood. It was not only for building these walls, but for firewood, for building all their houses and other things that probably denuded the area. But uh, So it indicates that there was some kind of uh, threat, and a continuing threat, that over a hundred year period they built this wall four times. Uh, they, where we've dug thus far, we haven't seen evidence of the wall being destroyed by fire or other methods, but being replaced, probably as the wood begins to rot in the ground, where all the moisture and insects are, they would replace it with a new and stronger wall. So another indicator that during Mississippi times, we do see a lot of evidence of conflict and warfare. In our excavations, the way we see this, is we see this, see this kind of dark stripe in the ground here, goes out this way, and turns this way, and this is where one of those square towers was. This would be the main wall back here, the tower projecting out. Here's the curving stain you see here where the round tower was from the first time the wall was built. See, it's a little different color, it's a different width. Um, so the way they overlap or you know, superimpose each other is how we can tell the sequence. And here's the same spot about a week later. We removed the dark fill, that's the dirt that filled in their trench, so we can see where the bottoms of the trenches were. They also built this right through where people used to live. We see evidence of houses and garbage pits and storage pits and other things from the residential use of that area before the wall was constructed. So we have this, again, urban renewal kind of thing going on, continuing occupation for hundreds of years for thousands of people, so the land is used over and over and over again. And the surface we walk on today is basically the surface they were walking on. We haven't had a lot of accumulation of soil to bury things deeply. So what we're Seeing as the bottom of their trenches, but they were digging down from you know about three feet higher uh, where the surface is today. But takes us, we have to usually dig almost this deep before we can see those colors in the soil distinctly. So that wall again enclosed the central ceremonial precinct, which included Monk's Mound, the Grand Plaza, and about 17 other mounds. So that was what we, what we think is probably where the high status people were living. But there's still a lot of activity and occupation out around outside the walls too. They probably all come in to help defend if there ever was an attack. All these things would affect, affect not only their agriculture but also the natural flora and fauna that they depended upon. So lots of things probably combined led to the breakdown of the system. People began splitting off into smaller groups, going elsewhere starting new villages with smaller ones, uh, or joining where they had relatives. But uh, so by the mid-1300s, the site was essentially abandoned. Uh, what tribes they became, we don't know for sure. The, the ones we're looking at more closely nowadays are some of the Siouan speaking groups like the Osage, the Ponco, and the Omaha. And their oral traditions, they were in this general area sometime in the past. We just don't know exactly when. And they believe they've got a connection to Cahokia. And they have some of the same kind of symbolism and, and cosmology things that we see associated with the Mississippian culture. So they may well be. So for these and other reasons, as uh, was mentioned earlier, Loki has been recognized as a World Heritage Site. And uh, UNESCO uh, did this in 1982. Uh, today there's, uh, like you said, 23 sites in the United States that are on this list of natural and cultural sites that are important to all mankind 
not just the country in which they exist. There's over a thousand now worldwide. And unfortunately, a lot of these are you know, being destroyed by ISIS and some of the other groups in the Middle East. So it's a tragedy that we're losing a lot of that ancient history. But uh, so we're in good company with uh, some of these sites, as you mentioned, in the Grand Canyon, the Great Wall of China, Taj Mahal, uh, pyramids in Egypt, and some of those in Mexico as well. So it's uh, this more or less led the state of Illinois to make a commitment to Cahokia. Uh, our old museum was originally a ranger's residence that we had converted into a little museum, but it was never adequate to tell the story of Cahokia. So it was one of the few times that there was money available in Illinois, and we uh, got the approval to uh, build a museum. So archaeologists from SIU Edwardsville did excavations first where the building was to go, found evidence of uh, about 80 different houses and different kinds of pits. This is a map of their excavation. So these, each one of these represents a house, Indian house. Uh, but we can see how their neighborhood changed over about a 200 year period. Uh, they weren't all built at the same time. But like I say, the same land was used over and over again. So it really helped us to learn more about how the hope could develop. And then the museum opened in 1989. Still call it new. <laughs> Uh, but it's uh, 26 years old now, so. And uh, if you haven't been there, I think most of you have since we opened, uh, we've got lots of nice exhibits of artifacts, and murals, and models, and dioramas, large and small, uh, showing you know, what daily life was like, how they made their tools and artifacts. We just opened a new exhibit uh, this August, uh, uh, Wetlands and Waterways, the Key to Cahokia. I don't have a picture of that in here right now, but if you haven't seen that, it's worth coming back for a visit uh, to see this, this new exhibit. Plus, we have a 22-foot uh, dugout canoe that was donated to us that was found in Arkansas and dates to about in the 1300s. And we've got that on exhibit, too. That's really neat to see. And we have special events throughout the year. I mentioned the nature culture hikes. We have Indian art shows. Uh, we have uh, one coming up in April. Uh, I think it's the 24th and 5th of uh, April, we, our spring uh, Indian market day. We have about 25 Indian artists from across the country. They'll be there selling jewelry, painting, sculpture, uh, ceramics, and many other things. So if you're looking for some unique uh, gifts for friends or family, it's a great place to go. And we have excavations in the summer. You're welcome to come out and watch those, and you can actually participate in an excavation. We have a program for volunteers. Uh, all you have to do is become a member of our Cahokia Mountains Museum Society, and uh, you can actually you know, participate in one of the excavations. So that's a quick look at uh, Cahokia. We are, due to budget crunches in the state, uh, closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, open Wednesday through Sunday. The grounds are open every day from 8 a.m. to dusk, but you're welcome to come and see us sometime. If you come back and see us for those that have already been.